Columbus is on his second journey. He's on his way back to the land he discovered to rescue the men he had to leave behind. But on the trip, he comes to island after island that has been attacked by the Cribs. Now Columbus and his men have to go to war with the Cribs. We're back for part two of Columbus. This is part two of our Columbus story. If you haven't listened to part one, please go back and check that out. But before we get started, check this out. Hey, I'm Joel. Hey, this is Troy. Have you ever thought about how many sermons have never been listened to because they were never recorded because they came out before recordings? On our podcast, Revive Thoughts, we take the roughly 1900 years of sermons and try to bring them back to life. We talk about the history, we talk about the setting, and every week we have a different speaker deliver these sermons for us to listen to once again. So this is your chance to listen to sermons by people like Calvin, by people like Spurgeon, by people like Knox, and maybe some people you've never heard of, like Johann Towler or Alexander White. Let us live and move and have our being and deal with men as if a dying, risen, interesting... See poor Lazarus in his full frightening misery and behind him Christ. The hand cannot alone deliver man. The body must... Co- you can find Revive Thoughts on any podcast app or player that you have and at revivethoughts.com. We hope you learn something new and grow closer to God. We're back with part two of Columbus. They did attack and kill a lot of the Crips and also took a lot of them as captives. Because both men and women were warriors, both were killed and both were captured. And here is one of the horror stories that is a stain on the Columbus trip. One of the captives was a woman. She was beautiful and Columbus sent her to the cabin of one of his lifetime friends as a surprise gift. The Cribs didn't wear any clothing, so when his friend arrived in his room, she was waiting for him. The man writes in his diary that he wanted to be with her and tried. She screamed and scratched him. He then whipped her. Her screams were heard around the ship, and then she became submissive and did whatever the man asked her to do. This was clearly rape, and the crew seemed to think it was funny. Perhaps because she was a crib, they thought it was okay. Obviously, it was not. After fighting the cribs, the crew continued on, and November 28th, they made it back to the fort they had left behind. Columbus saw land in the horizon and imagined seeing his fort again. He was officially the governor now. He proudly stood on the deck with his brother, telling him about the beautiful land, the peaceful people, and all the gold that would be waiting for them. Columbus ordered the cannons to fire as a way to let the men know they were finally back. He then waited to hear the cannons from the fort fire back. Silence. When they landed, they were not greeted by a single person. It was empty. The fort had been burned down. As Columbus and his men walked around the wreckage, a native leader walked out to greet them. He told them a horror story. Columbus's men had started stealing women and doing unthinkable things to the women. They'd also started treating the Tanu people cruelly. The tribes realized they had no choice but to stop them by fighting back. Columbus was heartbroken, not just that he had lost all of the men that he had left behind, but that his men had turned into barbarians with him gone. He said he should have left a priest with them. Columbus didn't blame the tribe, but instead blamed his own men. What the crew did is another reason people attack Columbus, but this is simply not fair, as Columbus was not there when they did it. Columbus told his crew they would build a new fort. They would pick the perfect spot. They found a large area of land, and Columbus made plans. Remember, he had a very large crew now, so he needed space. His plan was an area for 20,000 plus people. There would be a large church, of course, and houses and fields for the people who would live there, and a large palace for himself. His plan was bringing his family here one day and governing this land from their palace. 
He named the village La Isabella after the Queen of Spain. From December all the way till March, men worked to build the village. In January, the church was built. It was the first building to be finished. On January the 6th, 1494, the first church service on the new land was held. The man had communion. This was the first communion on this land. Things were going well, but then a bunch of men living in the village went bad. Fighting started to break out, and the men started finding women amongst the Tanu people. Soon a sickness spread through the village, and Columbus had to send a boat full of sick men back to Spain. He asked for new men and more supplies. He also told the queen about La Isabella. He also sent a letter with an idea. He wanted permission to send a whole boatload of cribs back to Spain. He hoped they would be helped in Spain. Perhaps away from the rest of their tribe, they could be won to Christianity, and the crown could help civilize them. Then they could return and be missionaries to the crib people. Perhaps the problem could be resolved that way instead of killing all of the crib people. The crown did not end up allowing the plan. But something else started to happen. Columbus started to have times when he could not move parts of his body. Now, looking at how he wrote about his symptoms, it seems that he had arthritis. Columbus began to feel desperate. His body was shutting down. He had not found Japan or a massive amounts of gold. He decided to leave his brother in charge of La Isabella, and he would set out with a small crew to look for gold in Japan. He traveled and somehow managed to weave his way through island after island. He came eventually to what is today the Bay of Pigs. Suddenly he found himself lost among a sea of islands. It was a desperate situation. On top of that, his arthritis kept getting worse and worse. Eventually he made his way back to La Isabella. But La Isabella would not be a place of rest. It was in the middle of a mutiny as he arrived. While he was gone, a group had completely abandoned La Isabella and built their own fort. They governed themselves and didn't follow the rules that Columbus's family had laid out, specifically the rules about how to treat the tribe and the women of that tribe. The tribe people had begun to hate all of the Spanish people because of what the second fort was doing. And there was war on the horizon. Columbus had to step in and deal with this. He sent a bunch of men home to Spain. He had a strict rule about the men not being allowed to have any women from the tribe. But he saw this rule was just not working. Some of the men had taken wives, set up farms, and were happily living on the land. They didn't want to live under the rule of the Columbus brothers. They wanted freedom. Columbus's body continued to deteriorate, and he began to get desperate. He had some gold from the natives who had been bringing it to them and trading for them, but it was not enough gold. He had not found Japan and he feared dying a failure. Then Columbus did something that up to this point he had refused to do. He agreed to take tribe people as slaves and sell them. This was a low point for Columbus. The priests that were on the trip tried to persuade him not to do this. They were angry because he was going to enter the slave trade. At first it was only cribs Columbus wanted to capture, but then he began to add even the Tanu people. 1,500 were captured, 600 were kept to work for the Spanish, 400 managed to escape, 500 were loaded onto a boat and taken to Spain. During the trip, 200 died on the boat. Of the 300 that made it back to Spain, 90% of them died before even being sold. Columbus's one and only attempt at being a slave trader had been a disaster. His priests had opposed him, and he made no money. The year is 1495. Just three years ago, Columbus had set sail to an unknown world, not sure of what he would find. Now he lives here on this island, governor of the La Isabella. In just three years, he had so much. But to Columbus, he still felt failure. He had not found Japan, and he had not found a lot of gold. The natives were still bringing gold to him, but not like before. At this point, Columbus's paranoia and arthritis begins to take over his decision making. He decided to make sure everyone on the island knew he was in charge. He set up an army and went tribe to tribe amongst the Tanu natives and attacked them. 
He made it clear he was in charge and that they would have to submit to him. He then made it law that every native man must bring him gold every month. Those who did were given a copper ring to wear around their neck as a gift. This was humiliating and made the men feel as if they were all slaves now. In order to keep up with the demand for gold, the natives had to stop farming their land, and then famine came. Then one day, Columbus's men came across an empty tribe. All supplies had been burnt, and the whole tribe had committed suicide. Their hopelessness had devoured them. Rather than serve the Spanish, they would rather simply die. The Spanish could not comprehend such grief. They were shocked and dismayed at this. And this village was not alone. Over the next few months, 50,000 Tanu committed suicide. When Columbus arrived the first time, there was 300,000 Tanu. By the end of 1496, there was 200,000. 100,000 had died from famine and suicide. But this would not be the end. Once Columbus left, and we're going to get to him leaving in a little bit, and others took over the area, it actually got worse. In 1508, there was only 60,000 left. And by 1548, just 52 years after Columbus had first arrived, there was only 500 left. From 300,000 to 500 in just 52 years. However, it is unfair to blame this on Columbus, since he was not there for most of that time. In fact, he was only there for less than five years of those 52 years. But back in 1495, while there's still over 200,000 Tanu, a new shipment of supplies has just arrived. With it are letters from Columbus. He heard that the men he had sent back to Spain were spreading lies about him. They were claiming he was taking land for Portugal and not Spain, and that he was killing the Spanish men and treating them cruelly. Columbus knew he had to return to Spain to speak to the king and queen in person. He would bring back the gold he had, try to tell them he knew where there was more gold, and that Japan was just around the corner. Columbus took some of the native men back to Spain with him. Along the way, they hit another storm. The men tried to throw the native overboard to lessen the load, but Columbus refused and kept the native men alive. He finally landed back in Spain and went to see the king and queen. Columbus spent some time clearing his name and spending time with his boys, who were growing up fast. He convinced the king and queen to let him take a third voyage, and he got a job for his younger son, Ferdinand, working as a page in Parliament. He hoped this would give his son a chance to make good connections and prepare him for a life in upper class. It was still Columbus's goal to put his family first and to have his family be part of the upper class of the community. This time he was given six ships. However, his reputation had been hurt so badly by the men who had returned that he could not find a crew. The crown sent him with 300 men, but they were mostly criminals who had been offered a pardon if they agreed to be part of the crew. So the crew set out. Eventually, they ended up at the equator. What they didn't understand about the equator is the lack of wind. There was zero wind and a lot of heat and no rain. The men began to despair. There seemed to be no hope. The extreme heat made all the food spoil and they ran out of water. Finally, a slight wind came and the boat was able to move. But this long time baking in the sun without proper food or water made Columbus's arthritis advance very quickly. He also damaged his eyes and began to go blind. Once they began moving again, they began to have hope. Soon they spotted land. It was Trinidad. When Columbus landed, he thought it was the most beautiful land he had ever seen. In fact, he believed he had found the Garden of Eden. Others after him would search this land for the tree of life because they believed this beauty could only mean it was the Garden of Eden. Things were starting to look up for the crew. Columbus stood on the deck. It was early morning. Most of the crew was still asleep. He liked to be up early to watch the sunrise. His body ached, his hands were clenched, and he could not open them. His legs were stiff, and walking now was hard, and he had a large limp. 
He was also now unable to see clearly. Yet he stood there on the ship. Just for a moment he felt peace. There was a calm in the air. Then suddenly he heard something. It was a roar. The ocean was roaring. He turned towards the open sea and he could hear it getting louder. He called for his lookout. He turned toward the open sea and shouted, Wave! A tidal wave was roaring towards them. All they could do was grab hold of something and hold on for dear life. Somehow, the boat survived the tidal wave, and not even one crew member was killed. Columbus named the area Dragonmouth, and the name is still used today. The next land they found was Venezuela. Columbus was so riddled with arthritis and blindness that he was unable to leave the ship. He had his crew take the cross to the land and plant it and claim it for Spain. As he continued on and landed on each island and planted a cross for Spain. With each island, Columbus could only see the land from his boat. And by sea, I mean he could kind of see it, as he was going blind. However, for the first time in all his trips, he stopped being disappointed that the land was not Japan and began to see the awe of the land himself. Eventually, he made it back to La Isabella. Once again, the man had turned on the Columbus brothers. There were now three brothers in the city, Christopher, Diego, and Bartholomew. The men had created a life here and they wanted freedom. They had wives, farms, children. They didn't want to live under the rule of the Columbus brothers, who they saw as Portuguese men. If they were under the rule of anyone, they wanted it to be a Spanish man. The rule they hated the most was that no man could have a native wife. Columbus gathered the men and asked who wanted to leave and go to Spain. He sent them home on a ship. To those who remained, he dropped the rule about the women. That rule had kept the women safe. However, the women were now wives and mothers to the children of the Spanish men. The rule was unnecessary and causing more harm than good. He also set up a system where he gave the Spanish men land and then allowed the natives to live on the land and farm the land as long as they gave some of the goods to the Spanish men who were the lords of the land. He, of course, did not make up this system. It was the only system that Columbus knew. It was simply the way things were done at that time. These Spanish men created families with the native people, and this created a whole new people group. We call them today the Latinos. Things were going well for a little while, and then fighting broke out amongst the men. Columbus found a group of men guilty of causing riots and had them ordered to be killed. At this point, Columbus wrote a letter called a letter to the nurse. In this letter, he talked about how bad the men had become. He said in this letter, the violence of the community of turbulent persons has injured me more than any services have profited me. As we can see, he was so disgusted by what the men were doing. He also wrote that people wanted sex slaves as young as age nine. Now people use this to attack Columbus. They take that one line out and say he was excited about the number of slaves he could sell even nine-year-olds. But the whole letter is about Columbus trying to get his men under control. He was so angry at one man for what he had done to the women of the tribe, cut off his ears and nose, and he had other men killed. Now, he had a group of men he had found guilty, and they were about to be killed. Before they were killed, a boat docked. One man was on board, named Boba Dia. He hated the Columbus brothers. He hated mostly just the fact that they were not Spanish. He hated that not Spanish men were governing over Spanish men. The men who Columbus had allowed to return, and by the way, he had sent letters with these men telling the queen and king that they had done a good job and should be rewarded. These men had turned on Columbus and had told lies about him, mostly that he was working for Portugal and not Spain. Bobadilla showed up and walked into the town with a letter from the king and queen. He was now in charge of La Isabella, and he would be holding a trial for the Columbus brothers. The men all wanted to live in freedom with no one ruling over them, and this was a great way to get rid of the brothers who ruled over them. So they all had a lot of stories to tell. Even the men who had been found guilty and were supposed to be hung were allowed to testify. These men were set free and were not hung. The Columbus brothers were stripped of all their belongings, shackled, and marched to a boat where they were sent back to Spain with a letter written by Bo Badia. This is the letter that was found in 2006, 
and led to a BuzzFeed article, which led to the students at Notre Dame demanding Columbus's mural be taken down, which led to the covering of the mural and the debate we started out with. To say the least, to put everything you believe about Columbus on this one report is simply not wise. Obviously, the men who testified had reasons to lie, and the man who wrote the report hated Columbus because he was Portuguese, which is not very woke, to say the least. The brothers landed in Spain and were still in shackles. Even those who didn't like Christopher Columbus were shocked at this treatment. A man almost completely blind, extremely disabled by this time, shackled and led through the streets to a jail. The brothers spent six weeks in prison before the king and queen were notified about them. The king and queen immediately called for their release and asked them to come to the palace as special guests. They were given the report by Bobadilla and could tell right away it was biased and unfair. They deemed that the brothers were innocent and demanded that all their goods be shipped back to Spain and returned to them. Christopher was reunited with his family. He was horrified to learn that his son, who had been working as a page, had been treated extremely poorly. Columbus's enemies, who didn't want a non-Spanish man claiming land for them, had treated young Ferdinando as a slave boy. They had tortured him with stories of his father, calling Columbus the governor of insects. Columbus had dreamed his boys would grow up with a name that meant something, a father they could be proud of, that his boys would be able to be in the highest circles of society. But his name was a joke, and his family had been treated horribly. Christopher began wearing monk's clothes. He began to rebuild his reputation that his enemies had worked so hard to destroy. He wrote a biblical book about prophecy and talked about how God had guided him and helped him on his travels. In 1497, word came that an Italian explorer named Cabot had found land. This would be the land known as Newfoundland, Canada. Columbus wanted to find more land, and he still wanted to find Japan. In 1502, almost unable to walk at all, and almost blind, he asked the crown for another voyage. The Queen Isabella is the one who agreed, on some conditions. First, there would be a voyage of only discovery. He was not to govern his land. He was not even allowed to visit La Isabella. Columbus set out, with him his brother Bartholomew, who would do most of the navigation, and Ferdinand, Columbus's son. He sailed to the area where La Isabella was. Columbus could feel a storm was coming. He knew it was going to be really bad. At the port of La Isabella was a group of ships getting ready to sail back to Spain. One ship had all of Christopher Columbus's things on it. All of the things Bobadilla had taken from Columbus after finding him guilty, but the Queen Isabella had ordered return to Columbus. It was all of his wealth. Columbus sent word to Bobadilla that a storm was coming, and he should keep his boats in port. Bobadilla said Columbus was an old man who didn't know anything. He laughed at him and refused to listen. Christopher asked permission to come to shore just long enough to wait out the storm. Bobadilla refused. It was humiliating for Christopher. Bobadilla set out with his ships. The next day, a large hurricane came. Over 2,000 men were killed. Only one ship survived and made it back to Spain. And it was the ship that held the wealth of Columbus. There were more hurricanes that came, and Columbus and his crew, although not able to come into port, had found a harbor to land in and had survived all of the storms. Columbus traveled on. He found Cuba and then Honduras. In Honduras, Columbus had a small church built and had a priest on board and hold a church service. They had communion all together. They then traveled on and landed in Costa Rica. After six months at sea, they found the Panama Canal. Then another storm hit. The river was so high as they sailed on, but soon the river went back to its regular levels, and the boats were suddenly stuck. They couldn't go anywhere. One of his ships had to be left behind. The other made it out to the river. Then they went on to Jamaica. The boats were also destroyed by shipworms, which is a kind of termite. Their boat was so badly damaged, it was unable to float. It was ruined. There was nothing they could do. They were stuck. And the men had malaria, and they were stuck now on this island, and it seemed hopeless. Christopher told the men he needed someone who could take a canoe and sail a canoe to La Isabella and get help. This was basically a death trap. That was impossible. But it was the only hope. One man agreed to do it. The natives gave him two canoes. He added sails to them, and a few other men agreed to go as his crew, and they sailed out. 
Days passed and then weeks and then months. It seemed clear no one was coming to help them. Some of the men built a raft and decided to sail out themselves. Christopher tried to stop them, but he was a crippled, blind old man. There was nothing he could do. The men took natives along with them. As they sailed out a little ways, the waves started to hit them, and they thought they were going to get turned over. They threw the natives off the raft to make the raft lighter. The natives grabbed hold of the edge of the raft to survive. The men took swords and hacked off their hands. Eventually, a few made it back to the land where Christopher was. Finally, one day, a year after being left on the island, they saw a ship in the distance. But as it got closer, he realized it was too small to take the men back. It came with food and provisions for the men and hope. The canoes had made it to land, and someone would come with a ship large enough to bring them all back to Spain. But it would be a while longer. Eventually, they did make it all the way back to Spain. Shortly after their return, Queen Isabella died. Columbus spent the rest of his life writing books and fighting for his boys to have the things he had been promised. What he wanted most for his boys was a name they could be proud of. Columbus died just two years after he returned from his final trip, and he did have a name his boys could be proud of. His boys were teenagers when he died, although the term teenagers had not been invented yet. They would have been considered young men. But even after he died, he was not done traveling, or at least his bones were not done traveling. In 1537, his bones and those of his son Diego were sent from Spain to Santo Domenico to be in the cathedral there. As time went by, they became less important to the Spanish Empire. In 1795, his bones were sent to Havana. In 1898, Spain went to war with the United States and their remains were sent back to Spain because they didn't want to fall into the hands of the Americans. His sons did not follow in his footsteps of sailing the sea. They instead became writers and collectors of books. The library started by his son is still there today and can be visited. So, was Christopher Columbus a hero or a villain? Well, he did connect Europe to a few different continents, and did so without a map, and while crippled and half-blind, and eventually all the way blind. Sometimes he stood up for those who were native on the lands, and sometimes he took advantage of them, even entering the slave trade for a short time. He wanted to spread the gospel, but he also wanted to make a name for himself. There's a verse that comes to mind while doing this research. You cannot serve two masters. Columbus wanted to spread the gospel and get rich. You can't be controlled by greed and at the same time be controlled by the Holy Spirit. He also was a man who came from nothing. He was a cabin boy at age 10 and worked his way up. He educated himself and he became the greatest explorer of his time. Next week, we're going to look at the Pope, who was a Pope at the time of Christopher Columbus, and one man who stood up to the Pope. This pope was possibly the most corrupt pope ever. If you like these podcasts, please subscribe and leave a review. This helps others find the show. Also, share with a friend who might be interested. For more podcasts, blogs, videos, check out lauraleesiemens.com. I'll see you next week. <laughs>